Hi, everybody. Um, let's see. So my talk today is about the desktop distribution. Uh, and that really you know, means a, a whole different set of things. I'm going to go through them, sort of looking at how that we've been trying to do for a while. But um, it, and actually do that in practice as we're getting close to putting all so the classic desktop distribution, well, what's it made out of? Well, it's made out of packages, packages and more packages. Um, and that you know, basically means that every installation, every different user system is its own custom system. We actually, if you, if you went to everybody in this room and looked at what they had on their laptop, even if they were the same distribution, even if they're running Fedora 24, they'll actually have a distinct list of packages. Um, so if somebody says, we've tested Fedora 24, they mean they've tested some set of packages that are not the same as what you have on your system. And we, okay, we can't actually distinguish if the set of packages you have in your system is a good version of Fedora 24 or a bad version of 24, because there's no definition of that. Every set of packages you have installed is some valid version of Fedora 24. That's um, a problem, and you know, that leads to another problem that I think we've all experienced, is you take any classic desktop distribution made out packages, install it, and then upgrade it, then upgrade it, and then upgrade it, you eventually get something that's sort of vaguely like what you would get from a fresh install, but not very. We don't, we actually are doing every upgrade individually by picking up set of that comes up with what was the same as the fresh install. And often you'll find that your set of applications you have installed and include supposed to be default, or that you have some system service running that has no point there. It's from some input method we're using three releases before. And all these sort of problems mean that you know a distribution desktop distribution can be pretty reliable. And I think a lot of the ones out there have gotten that point, but they're never really as reliable as we'd want it to be. I don't think any of us would really be happy about giving Linux on the desktop to a casual acquaintance saying, here you go, it's installed, don't call me again, it'll be fine. <laughs> you sort of know that, that we expect that at some point you're going to hit hit a problem that you need an expert to be hands-on in the system. And so the question is how to take it to the next level and to remove that need for uh, expert hands-on, to just assume that once you have Linux installed, it's going to keep on working. Well, the basic idea is pretty simple, and it's not new. It's that you have an operating system image that's fixed, that you install applications on top of it, which are made in, in packages. They're self-contained. They're not, I say packages, but I really mean bundles, I mean flat packs. I mean something that it comes along with its dependencies and it doesn't need anything from the host system. And then the third thing, which I'm going to concentrate a little bit about on this talk, is that we also want to support developers. And developers have um, development environments which are also isolated from the host and that allow them to develop on any sort of um, dependencies, any sort of system they want. So, you know, this is not new. So the old PC did this years and years and years ago. Um, Android does this, Chrome OS does this, and Endless OS does this in a very similar way um, that I'm going to be talking about using some of the very same technologies. But I, I guess the difference here is I'm really talking about how do we bring this to everybody? How do we bring this to the classic Linux user, the classic desktop user? Um, and also, how do we bring that to Fedora? So this is Fedora Workstation. Probably all have either you run it in some cases, or you have at least heard about it, you have some idea about it. So what are the basic ideas of Fedora Workstation? Well, it's mostly pure GNOME. There are just a few things we change, like we ship Firefox instead of web. It's meant to be a nice general purpose operating system like GNOME that really should be um, suited for anybody to use, but it has a focus on developers. That, you know, if we want to make it good for anybody in particular, we want to make it good for a developer. Um, that's mostly coming out of what, you know, where we, where we want Fedora to be in terms of the marketplace, in terms of how it fits into, um, into 
you know, for how Fedora Workstation fits into the larger Fedora ecosystem of Fedora Workstation and Fedora Server and Fedora Cloud. Um, so Fedora Workstation is meant to be good for developers. So the project we've been beginning to work on is Fedora Atomic Workstation. Now, I put Atomic in quotes here because it's not an official name. Uh, Fedora Atomic Workstation builds upon a lot of the stuff that was done for Fedora Atomic Host. And Atomic describes pretty well how it does upgrades, but Fedora Atomic Host brings in a lot of other things that aren't necessarily here. So consider Atomic Workstation to be a working name. So it's just like Fedora Workstation, but it, um, it deploys with OS3 images and apps are in flat packs. So we actually actually have to figure out how we're gonna get back and make it work for developers because it has that focus on developers that it inherits from Fedora Workstation. So I'll really go over OS3 pretty quickly here because I mean, it's been talked about at Guadalc many times before. Um, it's basically like Git, but for trees of binary files. Git is designed to have a tree of source files, text files, you can diff. Um, and then it's very efficient for distributing them, for getting new changes. Well, S3 is the same, but it doesn't really care about what's in the files. It says there's a whole bunch of binary blobs there. And it's meant to be your entire operating system tree, for example, is represented that way. And when you get a new operating system image, OS3 is very efficient over the wire and say, I just need these new files. Um, where is it used? Well, it's used for a long time in GNOME Continuous, that's our sort of test operating system distribution that we build every night, every time a change makes, we rebuild GNOME Continuous. As I said, it's used for um, Atomic Host, which is something coming out of RHEL and Fedora, which is about, really about being a very lightweight operating system to run containers on top of. It's used by endless OS, and it's used internally in Flatpak, because if you have a tree of binary files, that's good for an operating system, but it also makes sense as an application. But okay, that's how we're going to distribute this operating system image. But how do we make it? What do we make this operating system out of? Make it out of packages. <laughs> um, so I mean, I said packages have this problem that when you make an operating system out of them, it's very undefined, it's not standard, but it doesn't mean that a package is useless. Some of the um, advantages of a package, well, there are years of packaging work there. If you see, think about something like the Linux kernel package that Fedora ships, there's a lot of intelligence, a lot of, it goes into that and knowing, okay, what version of the kernel should be used? Do we have to, how does it work in the way to firmware? All that, things we don't really want to reproduce, you know, to create a new thing within Fedora that has a different version of the kernel. That would be, you know, a t huge amount of duplication. And also importantly, you know, if you're going to ship with a bunch of software, you have to worry about security for it. You have to say, you know, what are the security fix, you know, fixes going in? Do they have CVE numbers? Do, are we shipping the right, all these CVEs there? Uh, I mean, are we shipping the fixes? Is this particular vulnerability fixed? This is also like, it's probably a couple of full-time people's work to, to track that. Again, we can't reproduce that within Fedora. We wouldn't really want to reproduce it independently. Packages also mean that, you know, there are, um, like a standard Fedora workstation install includes about 1,300 packages. If every time um, any change went into Fedora, we had to rebuild everything as a big source tree, that would take a long time. And, we re and packages allow us to say, we're just going to rebuild this one package. I want to try out a new version of GNOME Terminal. I'm going to just rebuild GNOME Terminal. I'm not going to rebuild everything. And it's also that same lack of rebuilding means that probably if you just update GNOME Terminal, the OS tree before that and after that are going to be pretty similar, are going to be com efficiently compressed. You can, and that there might be a problem if we're building everything is that you make the wrong change to glib and every GNOME program has a few bytes of difference and has to be downloaded. So packages will also reduce the amount of updates. Um, so the, to make it out of packages, we use RPM OS tree. And RPM OS tree is, has a couple of different things there. Um, first, it has the code to actually take a bunch of RPMs and assemble them into an OS tree. Um, secondly, it has tools for the client side to make it a little bit smarter interface for upgrading. So for example, when you upgrade with RPM OS tree, it tells you, here are the packages that change, here's the old version, here's the new version. Um, 
And then finally, RPM OS3 adds of facility for layering packages over the top. So you can imagine that we have four-door workstation. We have 1,200 packages there. You know, especially in the early cases, we're not probably going to get those 1,200 packages right. You know, maybe we forgot something. Either you can assemble your own OS tree there, or you need a way of adding a few packages that you forgot. So that's package layering is. There's a command just recently added, RPM OS tree package add. And that basically says, add the package to a list of layered RPMs. And what then RPM OS tree does internally is it composes a new tree locally um, that includes everything in the upstream tree plus those packages you've added on. Um, so to create a new OS tree, to, go, to reboot into it, you actually have to reboot. So this is not all that convenient, but it's certainly better than having to say, well, I need to create a whole new OS tree to be able to use this system. But, you, know, the, you should think about this, about package layering, is the more individual packages la you layer on, the more you have that old package pane. We don't want to have people have hundreds and hundreds of packages because then there can be conflicts, then there are untested pieces. Package layering is really a way of adding a few small modifications that you need, and it's not a replacement for just installing arbitrary packages. And, uh, one more OS3 feature that's sort of cool for developers is OS3 admin unlock, which says, I have a local system I booted. Let me put a writable image on top of it. And you can change it however you like. You can do a make install right onto your root file system. And then when you reboot, that's gone. So if you, you know, want to try, you know, you really want to try changing some system component, that's a pretty good way of doing it and not completely trashing your system. Then, so that's the operating system layer. On top of that, we're going to put Flatpak. I'm really not going to talk about Flatpak at all because we've talked about Flatpak a lot at this Quadic. Um, Flatpaks are how you use functions. But I'll, one thing I will say is, well, where do we get these Flatpaks? If you'll go out there to Flatpak.org, you'll find maybe 50 different applications in Flatpak. We're hopefully going to be increasing that. But the number of applications in Fedora currently is much bigger than that. I don't have an exact count, but it's probably close to a thousand things you could say are applications in Fedora, games and old X applications and all that. And we'd like to make these available without having to wait for everybody to get into the Flatpak ecosystem. So the plan here, which we have some prototypes of, is that we're going to rebuild um, RPMs, which have applications, and make them into Flatpaks in a mostly automated way. And we have some prototypes of that working. Alex did a prototype about a year ago, and I've started trying to integrate that into the Fedora build system. So I'll be saying, if you have uh, RPM of Tux Racer, you want Tux Racer, we'll provide you a flat pack of Tux Racer that just automatically created out of that RPM. And that usually works pretty well, and we probably can get, you know, 90% of that thousand, thousand of applications there available to users as an intermediate step that will make this accessible sooner. So, so just like out of this, you can get um, unofficial OS trees of uh, Fedora right now. We'll have more official ones built completely within the Fedora infrastructure for Fedora 25 this fall. Flatpak support in GNOME software is, is pretty good. Um, software, GNOME software support for OS tree is still in progress. There are some initial steps on it, but we still need to finish that. And the idea of creating Flatpak RPMs, we have some prototypes and maybe, you know, in six months a year, we'll actually have that up and going. So we'll have these um, Flatpaks available. So let me just quickly demonstrate this. Um, so Okay, so here's a bunch of output showing that the system is actually running RPM OS tree. LibreOff on here is from a flat pack. I've been using Polarion from a flat pack to get on IRC, doing stuff with Inkscape from a flat pack. So mostly I'm um, able to use this pretty much with, um, without a lot of problems running an, an OS tree of the root image. So if I do, how many packages I have, like 1,300 packages, almost all of them are in the OS3 image. Um, if we look at the status a little bit more, 
this is where I got it from the remote and the the name of the branch within their version. It's like the 83rd build of Fedora 24. Some commit garbage, you know, commit hashes. <laughs> um, and then this line here shows me this package layering. These are the packages I have la layered on top. So um, I needed a couple of floppy three packages to make Polari work. We have to figure out how to solve that better. It's all I have Git and I have GDB. And that's basically all I needed to be able to do some development and work. Um, and then I'll go a little bit more in the sort of next portion about how I'm doing development on here. Um, and then if you look back here, this is the previous version. It actually has the same base version, but it has the packages list is a little bit different. It doesn't have GDB on it. So basically, at some point, I said, OK, I need GDB on here. I installed it and rebooted it into the new version. And if I was to do a RPM OS3 upgrade, it would pull a new version, a new nightly version from, of, from upstream, and then reinstall those um, packages on top of it. And it has those packages cached locally, so this is actually quite fast. OK. Let's see. But what about developers? Because I have like four packages there. And I mean, I think if you know, if you start with JHBuild, if you start doing any sort of development of Fedora, you're going to install hundreds of packages. You're going to install all these develop headers and GCC and Automake and GNOME Common. And if you had all those layered on top, that sort of completely spoils the point of having an OS tree there. You might as well just forget that you bought the whole project. So how do we expect developers to work? And, you know, I think we can't talk about development completely uniformly. There are lots of different types of development, which are all related, but slightly different. Server development is probably the biggest focus for Fedora Workstation. That is what we're most interested in is people using it to develop their websites, develop their backends. Um, but it's also, you know, we also really want to focus on native application development. You know, we, native application development is what makes the GNOME desktop um, slick and nice and pleasant to use and makes it not just a big web page. Um, you know, because all of us in this room are also interested in developing on GNOME, not just the GNOME applications, but the core of GNOME, we need to think about how that's going to work in this new world. How do you hack on the new version of GNOME? There are also the scientific computing, there's, um, you know, kernel development, there's mobile development, there's a lot of different types there. and. You know, we have to sort of keep in all of these in mind as we're working through it and figure out which ones we want to focus on. I bold-faced the ones I think that are most important to think about right now, at least for the GNOME community. So, um, and there's some general principles that carry across all of these. And these, I would say, are what makes development more modern. Well, first, your development environment is not your workstation environment. I think, you know, we shouldn't have to say that I need GDK to compile against GDK, so I need to install GDK devel on the system, because that means I want to compile against the newer version of GDK, I need to upgrade the version of GDK on my system, maybe I'm going to break my system, you know, oh, I want to work on this other project that, you know, requires a different version of GDK, now I have to downgrade my GDK, that, that's not what we, where we want to be in. We want to say that, you know, for developing against GDK, your environment is the GNOME SDK version 3.2.2. So that's not necessarily your workstation OS. Your development environment should generally be reproducible. This is something we've worked on a lot with JHBuild um, and sort of gotten there, that if you build during, during JHBuild, we expect a GNOME application to compile in everybody's system. We don't expect to get bug reports that, oh, with this slightly different version of a dependency, it doesn't work. The idea of JHBuild is to have a consistent GNOME development environment for all GNOME developers. It mostly works. I mean, obviously, we still have a lot of stuff from the system for JH build, and sometimes we have problems with that. And you know, we actually spend a lot of time maintaining JH build, but it's a, a basically a working system for that. We really want that for every application to be able to say um, all the developers have a consistent um, environment. And I think we heard earlier that PTV is going to use flat packs to do that to say everybody's going to be using the same version of all the dependencies. It's going to be encapsulated inside this. Flatback runtime, and we don't have to worry about somebody using a different version of Python or a different version of this library. Um, in general, your environment can also be work across different hosts. Now that we have containers and VMs, we shouldn't have to do that 
I'm using Python 3.4, you're using Python 3.5, we need to make the code base work with both. We can say that there's a standard version that's going to work across different operating systems. It's going to work where we run our automated tests. If it's a web app, it can also be the same environment we're going to use on our um, deployment machine. So this is the idea of you do your de development in a container or in a flat pack, and that dependencies get carried across all the places the application runs. You know, I think it makes some of us nervous. We think, well, isn't this portability application good? Isn't it good that's been tested in a lot of different, totally different environments? And that may be true, but it's not. As long as you can send the same environment to your users, there's no real virtue in saying I'm going to work with all these different versions of Python. It's actually just an extra maintenance burden that you don't have to carry. That we shouldn't have to carry. Um, since I said server development is most important for Fedora Workstation, what does server development like look like? Well, if you leave Java outside, which is a totally different world, server developers tend to use lots of terminals. If you go on to look at a tutorial for how to develop with Django or how do you develop with uh, Node.js, they'll give you lots of terminal commands. Um, people use a lot of it, editors, whether it's... Um, you know, they might use Atom if they're more modern, or maybe they use Vim if they're not so modern. <laughs> not, but not often people use really comprehensive IDEs. And you know, that depends upon a bit among the language, but generally people are using more editors plus, plus terminals. And every language and project different um, framework has a totally different way of working. You know, we, there's not any great uniformity across projects. If you want to do an environment with Python, you use virtual env, and then Node.js is a different way of doing that. So we want to accommodate, accommodate this, but we also want to make it better than saying, here's a terminal, have fun, which is basically our approach to development now is here's a terminal, have fun. So I want to demo some ideas I've been working with. Um, under the name, use I'm going to say purple egg for this. This is, if it's not clear, is a code name. This is not a final name. We're not going to be talking about GNOME purple egg. Okay. So, so we're going to start off in a terminal here. Um, so purple egg has a command line version called peg, purple egg. And same goes, we'll see. We'll start off creating a, a template here. Okay, now it's going to do a bunch of stuff here. And I'll, I'll, so, as I said, I don't have really any development tools on the system. I don't, so I don't have Django installed on the system. Um, so how am I? Well, what it did is it created um, a, a small Docker container here. Um, it automatically wrote a Docker file for it. It said, um, it's based upon Fedora 24. It updated a few, pro you know, a few packages that wanted in there, and then some ones that are specific to Django. And then it user there to match my user in the system, so like share files between the container and the host. And a few more. Um, now. Inside my project directory now, there's something called my Django site. Now, long term, this is the command line version. I think that the non-command line version should look a lot like what Builder has for new projects, and maybe really they should be sharing the same code. Do we need two versions of Temple thing? Perhaps not. So I think one of the questions here is how does this, this relate to Builder? And I mean, I don't, we don't want to distract Builder from what it's really about, which is creating. GNOME native applications very slickly, but it's possible that there's some code reuse possible there. So it created a directory my Django site here. Um, and what, what's in here? Well, there's a couple of different things in there. The managed pi and my Django site are standard things created by the Django new project command. That's just template stuff. There's a VM directory in there, which if you're a Python developer, you might know there's uh, one of the standard ways of in Python of doing a virtual environment. And so this is, um, has a setup of virtual environment here. And I can do, um, I, you know, I could do whatever. So some package there. Um, uh, okay. I, okay. Anyways, <laughs> that's, that's not important here.
Oh, oh I, I, okay. I, I had forgot. I, I missed. I missed a, a basic step here, which was I need to actually go into this environment I created here. So that's peg has another command shell. I go into there, and now, now if I do. Okay. And solve that. Yeah. So if I had any dependency that I wanted for my project, I could do that. I could use setup tools and so forth. The question? Uh, there are some Python modules that rely on uh, C libraries, uh, for example, Pillow. How does. Uh... Okay. So let's, I'll continue, and maybe you can start seeing how that would work too. But um, but if I look at this, so I have a virtual environment here. But if I do, uh, how many files do I act, packages I have installed? I I have a completely different set of packages here. I created this Django environment here, and this is I mean, sorry, I created this Docker container here, and this is writable. This is not an a immutable OS tree. I can install whatever packages. Are. Um, this file peg that YAML actually configures that. So if I change that and added more packages there, then my um, they would be included in here. So if I needed GCC in there, I could add them to this file, and then setup tools would be able or pip would be able to compile whatever it compiled wants to compile, or I could use pre-compiled versions from Fedora. So we have an isolated environment here that you know this was I had a template here, so it was easy to set up, but I could also write this by hand. I could write this by hand pretty quickly too if I wanted to do it manually. Um, it's trying to work with how things work upstream. You know, I, I didn't say everything has to come through a Fedora package. I said I'm going to run a, a virtual environment in there, so everything you find online about how to install Python packages works. Um, and then, okay, so that's step one. But step two is is how do we integrate this into desktop better? And you know, how do you make this um, slick? So I go to overview. Now I search for my Django site. Now I get a search result here from Purple Egg for my Django site. And we launch it. And then it brings up a terminal and in there. And we, we see that um, thing, having a, a, a complicated command line prompt. I'm actually the project up in the toolbox. Um, this is a uh, diff slightly different attempt at a tab user interface. You know, this is not again prototype user interface. Um, if I create a new tab, it's also within that. It's not an arbitrary terminal. Um, and then we can even do more slick integration here. Let's see. Let's say I want to check this into get. Yeah. Okay, so you see over here on we we have a little drop down just there. So it, it, so the purple egg noticed that you're doing get here and so your get status up in there. I can even do get check out this being. I can go there and I can go back to master. Oh, the idea here is not to be a replacement for git g, but to replace some of the stuff that we tend to do with the command line prompt. There's only so much you can stuff into your command line prompt before it completely takes up your entire screen. Um, and I think we, there are other things where areas we can go with that. If you have a, you know, a test server, we can add some interface to say, you know, click here to open the bread browser on your your test server. Or, um, you know, I think that there are other things that maybe perhaps fit into the same idea of a little bit of minimal user interface that improves the operation there while sticking within the idea of a terminal. Okay. So, I mean, okay, so that's a, a sketch of how we might do server development. Native application development, it's flat pack, flat pack, flat pack again. You know, that's, um, we want to make GNOME Builder good. We want to make GNOME Builder be able to build against the SDKs and um, do everything we need there. And and generally, yeah, Alberto? <laughs> Did I get it wrong everywhere? I'd, okay. <laughs> fingers, I mean, fingers type what they want, whether you know what it is or not. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then the last type of development I want to discuss is GNOME development. 
And this is, I don't have answers here. I think this is something I'd like to discuss with people. JHBuild is, has a lot of information encoded into it. It's a very mature set of configuration files. And it's pretty good. But you know, we don't really need it for application development anymore. If we're going to be say, pushing flat packs, if you want to build new gedit, you should use the gedit's JSON file for making a flat pack out of it. That will pull the right version of GTK source view. We can put improvements and be able to hack GTK source view the same way. But there are lots of pieces of GNOME desktop that don't work in that model, like GNOME shell or GNOME online accounts. And more, more of the question is how to uniformly give a vision for hacking on GNOME that doesn't require a lot of um, project specifics. Right now, if you want to hack on these more complicated pieces like GNOME online accounts or GNOME shell or, heaven forbid, GDM, then you're going to have to like, go to the maintainers and say, how do I do this? I tried to do this. It didn't work. How do I get it installed in my system? And you know, you could possibly you know, build the distribution package and modify that, but that's a lot of work. So I think the answer is that say, here's how you hack onto GNOME. And you know, I don't quite know how that's going to look like. Is that still GH build? Can we figure out how to do local modifications at GNOME Continuous and try that out? You can build GNOME Continuous locally, but you know you better have two days to let it build. So can we download the GNOME Continuous, replace one module, then try that out? How do you try that out? Is it do one machine? Do one, how to log into a containerized desktop? So these are things I think we need to figure out going forward with, with GNOME to really make GNOME a bit more approachable and not have this sort of initial JH build the world step, which is not very friendly to newcomers. So, um, a time for, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions here. Yeah. Okay, oh, it's over there. So the way you, you develop new software it's it's kind of also ties in like how you get dependencies if you want to like for example gimp wants to provide something for windows and they need to have a way to provide the dependencies there and it's kind of like the same problem it's, it's it just comes up everywhere yeah i mean i think that's a interesting idea that if we have um figured out all the gimp's dependencies to do a flat pack of, of gimp could we reuse that to build the Windows package, I, I don't really know because we'd have then you need a Windows equivalent of the GNOME SDK to say here are the standard dependencies. So it's going to be a little bit tricky, but I think it's certainly a very interesting idea. So one of the features you um, showed about the OS tree stuff early on is that you can have like these writable overlays. Yeah. Is that using OverlayFS? I believe it's using OverlayFS. Okay. One thing we should consider is that OverlayFS does not implement POSIX correctly today. And to fix it is basically going to be a rewrite of OverlayFS. In particular, it can't even untar correctly, given that you run out of uh, memory footprint for the directory entry caches, because things like I know data will change between when you started uh, in uh, untar, yeah. and then the inode gets like moved into a different overlay, moved up, yeah. and then breaks. So yeah. it's something that we're yeah, I, mean, I, I don't going to have I to look really into. Paid attention to the details of overlay file systems. Like it's no terrible. It's absolutely it terrible. Be, and some of the people have looked at that. You know, certainly the early versions of overlaying file systems were very bad. I think the thing is, this is just a development tool for hacking. So yeah. I, I'm much more willing to say we can do this that way than I would say if this is something we're going to put into production. Yeah. You know, we're using OS tree. We're not counting on overlays at all for that. We're just using basically forests of hard links. So that, you know, avoids that kind of dependency there. I think, you know, if you're trying to do a, a local install over your, your root file system and tar runs out of inodes. Yeah. That's unfortunate, but it's, it's certainly not something we have to be so careful about the um, stability of. It also doesn't deal with renames correctly. 
And so like uh, doing atomic renames over systems may not work as expected. And then the other issue is I think like SQLite and possibly Berkeley DB are going to be in bad shape. And I mentioned those simply because we're probably doing some sort of DB stuff at some point in time when you're using it. So no, we'll see. How, we we'll see we gotta, yeah, we gotta consider something else. Cosmo. Hey, I was curious um, about how you plan to build those applications uh, that you mentioned before in Fedora. Um, kind of in, in you mentioned like kind of like a transitional period where you yeah. still want to build them with packages because. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And this is a lot like what you were describing in your talk about what you're doing with rebuilding um, devs into Flatpak. Um, you know, I mean, again, you have to rebuild the packages to go to a slash app, and then you have to package that up into a Flatpak. Um, you know, so in Fedora, this needs to be integrated into our build system where we build stuff, into our Git setup there. So, you know, as I said, I have some prototype code that it, for that integration there that that does that i i'll be i guess early on we haven't hit as many problems as you described with hard coding slash user in there but we'll see how that happens when we get more there i think the idea is basically people will have to fix up the fedora packages when there that occurs so they work properly with slash app and hopefully that will be minor modifications and probably a lot more in the packaging this than probably in the applications themselves <laughs> Um, I'm very interested in, in in seeing how we can use OS3 and and uh, and whatever overlay we end up using on top of it to uh, to work on on uh, system services and everything that's going to be in the OS and outside the sandbox. I work on GNOME settings daemon and the control center and GDM and system D services that that talk to all those bits and in some cases we do need to be able to um, install an overlay like for example I, I want to be able to upgrade a particular library uh, and and restart absolutely everything that lives yeah. underneath and um, you were mentioning that using overlay fs for transient uh, changes. I'm just wondering if you've got any idea on how to do that for uh, on how to do that for um, uh, system services that that, uh, that we need to to outlive the a uh, reboot. If you I mean there is something there's another mode of I mean a lot called hotfix which will be permanent. You have more of a chance obviously of breaking things there but if you want to really just hack up your system for development purposes, that would allow that. So that basically says you can make these changes and then the last least until you next to an upgrade. I think, but I think how to do it more cleanly is what I'm talking about. You know, how do we hack on GNOME? It's like, how do I take GNOME continuous plus this new version of GNOME settings daemon? And I think that's, you know, I, I have rough ideas in my head, but I don't have firm ideas and we can talk about that more. Okay, thank you very much. Owen, thank you.